In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, amen. <clears throat> Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among them. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners. Now, come, Holy Spirit, fill the hearts of your faithful and kindle within us the fiery divine love. Send forth your spirit, and they shall be created. Let us pray. O God, instruct the hearts of your faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit. Grant that by the same Spirit may be truly wise, never rejoice in his consolation to the same Christ our Lord. Amen. Lady Guadalupe, St. Joseph, Fallen Terry, St. Nation Loyola, St. Faustina, Blessed Michael Sapochko, all God's angels and saints. The Lord be with you. Read it from the Holy Gospel according to Luke. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, let us go then to Bethlehem to see this thing that has taken place, which the Lord has made known to us. So they went in haste and found Mary and Joseph and the infant lying in the manger. They saw this, they made known the message that had been told them about this child. All who heard it were amazed by what had been told them by the shepherds. Mary kept all these things, reflecting on them in her heart. And the shepherds returning, returned glorifying and praising God for all they had heard and seen, just as it had been told to them. The Gospel of the Lord. Good evening. Let me just highlight a few points from that gospel passage, then we'll go back to our, our text in the diary. <clears throat> from that, I think the first message uh, from the shepherds is the importance of silence, because these shepherds, they lived in the fields, tending their sheep, and they lived in an an ambience and an atmosphere of silence. And I think it's incumbent upon us um, as we draw close to Christmas to not to be, allow ourselves to be bombarded by so much noise, but allow God to speak to us in the, in the silence, in the silence. Second is that these shepherds were in contact with nature. Nature is a, it's a means by which we can arrive at the, at the creator. The beauty of creation is a reflection of the beauty of the creator. It would be a theological heresy to say that creation is the creator, that's called pantheism. Uh, but the fact that creation reflects the beauty of creation is very much what principle and foundation is when meditating upon creation as a bridge by which we can arrive at the creator. And next, and uh, this is uh, maybe even more challenging is that the shepherds lived a very simple life. Would you characterize your life utter simplicity or total complication? Hello? I think most of us would admit that we, we live a very complicated, disordered life. I think they can teach us to try, try to do our best to live a more simple, frugal, detached life. 
you know, um, as I head toward the twilight of my existence, if I can speak like a poet, you know, and I'm closer to the end of life rather than the beginning. You know, if any of you were born in the mid '50s, you know what, you're ta- what I'm talking about. Is um, I'm trying to live a more simple life. It's kind of one of my New Year's proposal: live a more simple life, where I'm focusing upon God as the very center of my life, and then carry out what God wants me to do, and no, and no more than that. We we do that. I think we live at peace. Well, do God's will. Discern God's will for your vocation to it, no more. God could be demand God could be challenging us to do a lot, but that doesn't mean if he's asking us to do a lot, our life has to be thrown into a whirl of complication. Well, to be honest with you people, really what complicates life is sin. You hear me? Sin complicates life. I used an analogy about three hours ago in one of my classes at 3 o'clock, 3.30, saying, um, okay, the example I give, all of you, know some people that are sad to say in this situation, they're married, okay, with four kids. The marriage didn't work out. They're in a second marriage with another person with four kids. Man, four mother-in-laws? I mean, (laughs) Just the thought of that depresses me. And I think within a week, I would have a heart attack. No? <laughs> it's so complicated because you have to deal with so many people. Half the people, they probably hate your guts anyway, no? because of the, the separation. And that's because of sin. Or another one is, you know, tell a lie, then you have to tell another lie, then you have to tell another lie, and there are people involved in lies. I mean, you're in a ball of confusion because of the, the chronic lie syndrome, if you like that expression. So let's make a proposal for next year. Let's, let, let's give up sin for the year 2020. Amen? Amen. We give that up, we're going to be living a more simple lifestyle. More simple lifestyle. Then the, the, uh, <clears throat> the shepherds uh, teach us to see God's hand in the circumstances of life. Oh, God speaks to us through circumstances. With respect to the... Uh, shepherds and the kings. Another key symbol is that, of, is that of a star. Who are the stars in your life? Now, we would not be here if God did not place stars in our lives. Now, I'm not talking about Hollywood stars or, you know, I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the theological interpretation, the star that the Magi followed, are those who bring you closer to Christ, the light of the world. Because they follow that star. Who are those stars? Who are those stars that have brought you to where you are right now? I know if I didn't have certain stars in my life, I, I wouldn't be here. Probably be a skinhead that would have been shot underneath the Brooklyn Bridge, maybe. 
1999, I don't know. <laughs> Skin it, it's a cholo americano, right? No? Probably, no. But God was able to put certain stars in my life. Good mother, good father, brother, good professor, good spiritual director. But I, I, that's worthy of a holy hour. It's worthy of a holy hour. Let me, let me give you an example. It's almost a, it's kind of a humbling example. Um, well, I'll tell it. It's good to be humble, right? Uh, when I was brought up and raised, probably different than most of you people, having my own room was a dream. You know? A lot of kids, teenagers, they want to have their own, own room. If you're one of nine, forget it. It's pie-in-the-sky idealism. Having your own room. I'm not, I'm not a. I don't live in Beverly Hills. No. So I had to share a room with uh, with one of my siblings, and it happened to be the one that was closest to me. We're Irish twins, which means that we're born within 11 months. So um, I remember one occasion we had we had bunk beds. You know what those are? Yeah. Is that the, we'd have to alternate. None of us like to sleep on the top bed. But, you know, I had to alternate. And every other week, I preferred being closer to the ground. I'll tell you why, you know. You had the guardrail, and I always had ants in my pants. And I would knock down the guardrail at 2 o'clock in the morning. I'd fall on the ground. It'd be like a mi you know, minor atomic, atomic bomb, no? <laughs> Thanks be to God, I've got a hard head, no? But getting back to the star is that uh, different than all you people, different than all your people here, I didn't like to go to school. I'm, you, you, I'm sure you people love to go to school, right? It was your dream, right? As well as Andrea and Marina and you know, Raquel, you just love to go to school, right? I didn't like going to school. But uh, because I, I preferred to play baseball, throw snowballs at the public school bus. I mean, I just kind of, uh, <laughs> Catholic school, public school bus, no, I had a pretty good arm. <laughs> but, um, but what happened was I, was, I brought up and raised with a brother who was very disciplined. Get up, like in high, junior high school and high school, walk to school a couple of miles. Those when the kids were stronger, okay? And when they, you know, when, when they used to have books when they were at school, now the book is, they used to have books, no? Then he would finish school, then he would, uh, you know, deliver his, pay, we had paper routes, 50, 50 to 60 customers. And he'd come back, and then from afternoon until dinner, studying, 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 studying. After a half hour dinner, studying, 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 studying. From 13 to 18, guess who shared their room with him? So if you have someone like that, who's your older brother, what's going to happen? Hello? What? Well, I mean, it, there's no way out of it, you know. Uh, I, well, if he's going to do it, I've got to do it too. So be, be, because of that, I was able to graduate from high school, and now I've got, I've got three different degrees, thanks be to God, right? So if it weren't for, for that, it was a quiet, silent, good example. I think it was just... It was just in his nature to be very academic, and I tend, tend to be more athletic, no? But if it weren't for that example, I don't think I'd be here. I don't think I would have, have stu decided to study until I was 30 years old. 
I went beyond him, even though he's a you know, back surgeon. No? Back surgeon, graduate from Dartmouth and Columbia, and you know, the, the Ivy League school, summa cum laude, too, not only that, no? But there was a powerful, powerful, quiet example. That's a star. That's a star. Another star would be every Mass I went to mom and dad receiving communion and my mother kneeling down and for five minutes her, her eyes closed deeply absorbed in God. I never forgot that. I'm saying deeply, 99% of the people today after communion they're distracted, you know, they're, they're wandering their eyes and they're scratching their nose, they're looking at their watch. Uh, 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 yawning, no? Whereas five five minutes of real mystical absorption, I mean, I noticed that. That was a star. That was a star. So, who are the stars in your life? And be thankful. And then once you recognize that you have had stars in your life. All of you have to be a star to others. Amen? Amen? Especially parents with their children. Amen? Amen? But whether or not you're you're a father or a mother with children or grandchildren, whatever it might be, all of you, all of you have contact with people. And being a star means, another way of putting it, we have to give good example. Right, Grace? Yes. We have, to, we have to give good example. Whether or not we've got nine kids or we're working in an office with in a paganistic secular culture where we're called to preach God by a good work ethic, no? Honesty. We're all called to be stars. Amen? Amen? So that's my Christmas meditation for you. Say thank you, Father. Thank you, You're welcome. <laughs> that that de deserved a little thank you note from you people. <laughs> so let's return to our diary, St. Faustina. We had only started 182, the second paragraph. Um, Everyone has a handout. Now, once you finish these handouts, don't use it for your birdcage, okay? <laughs> or make airplanes out of it, okay? Okay, so we got one. Alma, you got one? Yeah. Today I was closely united with the Mother of God. I stopped and spent the whole hour speaking about Mary last week, if your memory goes beyond six days. I relived her interior sentiments. In the evening before the ceremony of the breaking of the wafer, which is a Polish tradition, I went into the chapel to break the wafer in spirit with my loved ones. And they asked the Mother of God for graces for them. Okay, let's stop on that. What are the graces? You have loved ones. You do. Okay, what are the graces that you can be asking your loved ones for, for Christmas. I'm going to give you a list. I'm going to give you a list. This can be your Christmas present for your loved ones. Number one, pray for your conversion and for their conversion. Amen? Amen. Right, that's uh, two-way street. Pray, pray for our conversion. 
and their conversion. That's pleasing to God. Pray that they will grow in grace. Right, Grace? Pray that they will grow in grace this next year. Pray that you will grow in grace. Okay, pray that they will all make a good confession, hopefully before New Year, or at least in the New Year. Let's be, let's be um, optimistic, but also realistic, okay? Maybe they're not ready right away, but hopefully the next year, they'll make that step. Next, pray that they will have, they will have a real desire and hunger for prayer. And that you also will have a real hunger and desire for prayer. I've said this several times, I can teach you how to pray, but I cannot give you the desire to pray. I had to beg for that. And pray, all, 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 these are all gifts you want to be placing on the altar for your loved ones. Pray that they will experience joy and happiness in an encounter with God. My experience of joy and happiness encountering God. Because if, if, if there's a joy and happiness not encountering God, it's, it's a fool's gold. It's, it's pseudo-happiness. It's a lie. It's a lie. No? Happiness can only be discovered and experienced in an encounter with God. And the next next gift to to, uh, to Christmas gift to beg that they receive is um, that they'll really want to receive the Eucharist. And that you also will not only want to receive the Eucharist, but you will humbly admit that you could receive the Eucharist better that your disposition can be improved. Amen? Amen. Or have you arrived at the apex, the zenith? That chance. I doubt it. And um, last but not least, <clears throat> I have I haven't I haven't made made a vow to do this, but I try to really live this seriously. Wherever I go, I I'm striving. Especially, oh, I've always done it, but especially over the past couple of years, to try to bring people to the heart of Mary. Yep. Really, I'm, I'm I'm working on it. Trying to get people to love Mary pray the rosary, consecrate themselves to Mary, entrust themselves to Mary. Um, that's going to be probably one of my New Year's proposals to, to, to work on that even more. Because times are really ugly out there. If we can get someone to love, as the Filipinos say, Mama Mary, get them to love Mary, and live that out, Mary's going to get them to heaven. And that's principle and foundation.
Saint Therese Lisieux said that if she were a priest, she said her greatest joy would be to be able to preach the Blessed Virgin Mary. Myself as an oblate of the Virgin Mary, it's one of my greatest joys. And I find as you get older, um, you can talk about, there's so many different ways you can talk about Mary. Well, the, the, gospel, the gospel today is one of the most important Marian passages, is the Annunciation. Given that there's a short of a priest and one of our priests has to be with Father Antolin, I just finished celebrating my third Mass. No? Uh, my homily this evening was Mary related to the Holy Spirit. If you want to have a deep union with the Holy Spirit, it's going to be through Mary. Mary is the daughter of God the Father. She's the mother of God the Son. She's the mystical spouse of the Holy Spirit. Colby says Mary is the incarnate manifestation of the, uh, of the Holy Spirit. You have to understand that. Well, it's hard to understand, but Colby, so much love for the Blessed Mother. He said, if you want to see the Holy Spirit, look at Mary. And just the beauty of the person, her virtuousness. There you have a reflection of the Holy Spirit. So um, I'm, uh, I'm giving you a, somewhat of an, a unique interpretation of Christmas gifts. No? So instead of worrying so much about material things, what would happen if you wrote that out for your loved ones and said, this is a spiritual bouquet I'm giving you for Christmas? If you gave that to me, I would thank you. Amen. What? Yes, you would. Yeah. Why not? I mean, what's what's wrong with that? Is it good or bad? Good. Yeah. Now, I, I would even say some of your relatives are maybe non-believers. They may be taken by, they may be may, may be shocked, but they, wow. She took her time to write out those intentions and she's praying that I'll have those gifts for a new year. Maybe that'll lead to the conversion. Amen? Yeah. Some of you are saying that if they, if they get that, they'll never speak to me again. Oh. Well, be audacious enough to maybe try it. No? Be audacious. And put below, I'm praying for you, your friend in Christ. Be surprised how people can be open, opened up. God's grace can work. You know what's really touched me over the past couple of years in the Annunciation? You know, did any of you go to Mass today? Yes. Is there, I mean, is there any, I mean, it's one of the most important biblical passages in the Bible. What's the verse that touches you most? Over the past couple of years for me, can I tell you? Nothing is impossible with God. Right, Eric? Do you like that? I mean, they're, they're, everything, every word is precious. And of course, Mary's fiat. <laughs> what can we say? Behold, I'm the handmaid of the Lord. I mean, that changed the universe. But the fact the angel said nothing is impossible with God, that's encouraging, isn't it? Especially if it, maybe you're in desolation. Well, nothing's impossible with God. Well, Lord, there's nothing impossible. You pull me out of desolation. There you are. You're in, you're in consolation, just like that. Right, Master? Yep. 
Amen? Amen. Don't, uh, don't be cynical. I mean, God can move mountains, okay? Amen? Amen. Trust. God can, God can move mountains. Remember a little boy, huh? So, let's move on. My spirit was totally steeped in God. Okay, when you're making a holy hour, are you totally, unreservedly, steeped, absorbed in God such that you're not even aware of the environment around you? Not yet, right? <laughs> well, I mean, Faustina was. Allow that to be kind of a little rebuke because the opposite of that is we're distracted, right? We're fragmented. We're pulled in so many different directions. Our memory, imagination runs us, runs us ragged. No. So really, another way, another way to explain that is, she was recollected. Pray for the grace when you do your whole. You you are recollected. It means you're, you're constant. You're, you're you're really concentrating. Maybe use an analogy. Mm. If uh, if I if I maybe get a YouTube where I can see, um, <clears throat> especially in sports, I see something in sports that is the top of the game. I'm captivated by that. Can I give an example? Um, I, I, I watch only for about three minutes, but I was, uh, and I pray for me because when I'm praying, I don't have the same attention. I so pray for my conversion. No? I was watching this boy, this boy from, you know, do you even know who Newport Beach is? Do you? There's this boy from New, Newport Beach. Uh, 29 years old. Uh, he, I think he went to a Lutheran college. And his name is Jarrett Cole. So you've never heard of him. Uh, you haven't. But he's uh, probably one of the greatest athletes in the world now. And he was, he's gone from a, a team called the the Houston Astros to the Big Apple. He's a Yankee now. You've heard of the Yankees? He's a local boy from Newport Beach. And he played on Pittsburgh and then the Astros. But I was just watching, just for three, three minutes, the way this guy threw, a, threw the baseball, I almost fell off my chair to see the expertise you know, thrown. You can imagine a ball coming at you 60 feet, 100 miles per hour. Imagine this, okay? Here to where, um, yeah, where Alma is, no? A little bit less, no? A ball coming at you 100 miles per hour. Then the next ball is coming at you 88 miles per hour, but it's, it's cutting through the air with this curve. We can barely see it curving. And I saw this for, for about three minutes where the batters are trying to hit him, and no one could come close to hitting the ball. Right now, he's a New York Yankee. 
I happen to be a Yankee fan. <laughs> Good chance that the next 10 years they're probably going to be in the top of the game because of one man. They tell me, Father Lai, what happens if he slips on ice in Manhattan where he's living now and he chips his elbow? It's over. A fluke accident like that because your elbow. No? You, you know, you chip your elbow and you're a pitcher, it's over. That could happen. And there goes, what, $370 million that they lose because he chips his elbow. I'm saying that because uh, you have to pray for my conversion. Totally captivated why this guy is throwing that fastball and the way he's not only throwing it, but he's throwing it on the outside corner, the inside corner. He's throwing it around the letters. So he's pinpointing where he wants to throw it. This guy is he's on the top, he, he's a, one of the top notch athletes in the whole world now. And this is what, the, what I thought. If he is a top notch baseball player, I should be a top notch priest. Amen? And you should be top-notch Catholics, shouldn't you? Yeah. Or do you conform yourself to be a rinky-dink Catholic? <laughs> Is that Tagalog, rinky-dink? No. <laughs> Why should we be conformed to be rinky-dink, mediocre, lukewarm, half-baked, you know, slothful, slovenly Catholics? Shouldn't we aim it to be the top of the game? Because just think of this guy, this, this guy, he, 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 you know, he works, what, three, out, three hours every five days. You know, he's, got, he's, got, he's got to rest five days. He's just throwing that. You, got to, you have to rest your arm four days. So he's working three, about three hours a week. You know? We're calculating each ball he throws is worth about $10,000. Wow. <laughs> it's a lot of money, isn't it? But every Hail Mary we make could be the salvation of an immortal soul. So I utilize sports as kind of like a motivation to try to be an athlete for Christ. Amen? Amen. And to be in the top of the game. And to make it to the World Series. And to be on the Nationals. Do you know the Nationals? No. They won the World Series this year, okay? Right, Gabriel? Yeah. So allow God to speak to you through circumstances. Right, Lupe? Yeah. Allow God to speak to you through circumstances. To Faustina. She was her spiritual steeped in God. You speak Spanish. Do you know what steeped means in English? Absorbida in forma total. That would be the, the translation. Steeped in God. Like a steep mountain. Very deeply immersed in God. During the midnight mass. So this is very appropriate because this is Christmas. A perfect timing, huh? During the midnight mass, Pasterka, or Shepherd's Mass, I just read Shepherd's, right? Shepherd's Mass. When Our Lady appears, does she appear usually with people who have double doctorates, PhDs? You usually have like a PhD from Princeton, Harvard, and Yale, hmm? or the University of the Philippines, hmm? the Harvard of the Philippines. No, sorry. She usually appears to very simple people. Juan Diego. Oh, 
Juan Diego was a simple person, wasn't he, Jaime? Pretty simple. How about Lourdes? Who did she appear to in Lourdes? St. Bernard? Of Clairvaux? Who? She was highly educated. Any of you ever see the uh, song of Brenda by Ingrid Bergman, the, the classic? <clears throat> Came out, what, in the 40s or 50s? <clears throat> Do you remember the scene? Remember the scene where she's a little girl, she's in class with a nun, and she's about to, they're about to make their first communion? And Monsignor, the priest, comes in, and the nun gives all of them a holy card. And Bernadette, remember the scene? It's a fifth degree of humility. What happened? The nun grabbed it from her. What, Lope? The nun grabbed it from the girl. Why? Because she didn't know how to pass it. Okay, so of all those children. She was the only one that didn't learn the catechism, so her first communion was delayed. In front of the priest, the other, she pulls the card away from her. She didn't learn her catechism. Huh? How would you like that if they did that to you? What happened if maybe Eric or Mary did that? You didn't do your holy hour. <laughs> <laughs> Probably never return again, right? <laughs> Fifth degree of humility, right? <laughs> but but God, God chooses the, the humble ones. He chooses the simple ones. He chooses the, the shepherds. When she appeared in Fatima, who did she appear to? Are you sure about that? Absolutely. Who were they? Jacinta, Francisco, and Lucia. They weren't rocket engineers that worked at NASA? No, no. They were simple shepherd children and they were illiterate. One of them, only one of them was going to learn how to read. The other two died without even knowing how to read and write. And they are among the youngest children canonized in the Catholic Church. But they had two good teachers, the Blessed Virgin Mary and the Holy Spirit. Amen? Amen. Good enough, huh? Good enough. <laughs> Teresa of Avila says that the Holy Spirit can enlighten you in one split instant with more knowledge than you'll learn in 50 years studying in the best universities in the world. Amen? Amen. Oh, good, Father, I'm not going to study anymore. <laughs> God can do that, right? He usually respects her own mental labor, right? <laughs> so shepherds. You do a long meditation on a shepherd. Bless you, Lucia. The roof went up. <laughs> Spend a lot of time on that shepherd. What is the most famous images in the Bible, Jaime? The shepherd, right? Remember, he listened to a, a homily of um, some priest that was in Juneau or Anchorage in, in Alaska. And he said, one of the most difficult things to do in preaching is to preach in Alaska about a shepherd and sheep. 
You know why? Because there are igloos, there are Eskimos, there are walrus, but there are no shepherd, no sheep. <laughs> <laughs> Haven't been to Alaska yet, have you? No. And that's 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 all of us who live in California, maybe in the Philippines or Mexico. We've all seen shepherdless sheep, right? The Philippines, yeah, they're all over the place. But Alaska, no. You got you got ice, you got walrus, you got sea animals. Hmm? <clears throat> Maybe God is calling us to be a shepherd. Amen. Maybe God is calling us to be more simple. Maybe God is placing sheep in our charge. Do you have one, Alma? Is that the person next to you? We're all called to be shepherds. But listen, the key to be a good shepherd to the sheep is we have to be a good sheep to the good shepherd. Amen? Say that three times fast, huh? <laughs> On a trabalingua, huh? Tongue twister, huh? For us to be good shepherds to our sheep, we have to be a good sheep to the good shepherd. Oh, but that sounds paradoxical. Yeah, it is, but it's true. It's true. Then ask yourself, ask yourself this question. Friend, who is the sheep that Jesus wants you to bring to the arms of the Good Shepherd? Do you hear me, friend? There's someone in your life right now. Nayeli, who's the sheep that God wants you to bring to the arms of the Good Shepherd? You say, my mother. Okay, good. <laughs> like all of us have someone. All of us have someone, some wandering sheep, some lost sheep, some stray sheep, some sheep that's maybe fallen off the cliff, maybe some sheep that's falling in the briars. That's in danger of being lost. Or some sheep that's walking close to the wolves, the wolves are vicious. They attack. They go for the kill. But these shepherds, what they do is they, they're aware of God's presence in nature. They hear the angels and they rush and they see Jesus there in the arms of Mary with St. Joseph. Then are you listening? Yes. After, after they have this encounter with God, then they can bring God to others. They had an encounter with God. They found Jesus in the arms of Mary, and that filled them with joy and conviction and enthusiasm, and they go out and they're telling this good news to the whole world. And that's the beauty of the holy hour. <clears throat> right, Imelda? The beauty of the holy hour is we, we encounter God in that holy hour. Once we encounter God in the holy hour, then we can go and bring that encounter that we had to the world around us. Beautiful working with children. You know, some of these, over the past couple of days, these little children, they're making the, um, the pesebres, they're making the, um, the Christmas scene. They come and they, they bring it to me, you know? And they do it with so much enthusiasm, you know? Um, 
about three hours ago, the little girl, maybe six years old, Father, look at this Christmas scene they have. Can you bless it? Yeah, of course. So I blessed it. I had my hand. I, I blessed it. And then I said, oh, this is beautiful. And I got up and I started, started to walk away. I said, thank you very much. You know? <laughs> <laughs> the little kid almost had a heart attack. You know? <laughs> I told the mother, your kid... And the little kid said, Father, if you really want it, you can have it. <laughs> said, that kid he really knows holy indifference, huh? <laughs> that kid is detached, huh? Simplicity, innocence, and detachment. Amen? Yeah, the shepherds teach us that. Simplicity. Innocence and detachment. In certain sense, the, the, the shepherds, they live, they live out what the gospel teaching of Jesus on spiritual childhood. Child recognizes his need for his mom or dad. We have to recognize our need for God. But also, a child doesn't worry about the past or the future, do we? Hello? We do worry, don't we? They don't worry about the past or the future. And also, uh, the nature of the, the child, like the shepherd, is um, they don't hold on to resentment or grudges. Do you? Do you, Padre? We don't. When I was about uh, eight, 18, I was looking out the window and my little sister was about four years old. And she was sitting in the sandbox. And she was with one of her friends. I think I was having breakfast and I was just kind of looking out. And there, all of a sudden, I saw that one of them threw sand at the other. The other one retaliated by throwing sand. It was a sand fight. I mean, they were just going at it, man. <laughs> it was like a sand fight. I mean, they weren't throwing it the way Jared Cole, the speed of 100 miles. They were, they were, they were pelting each other with sand. <laughs> and 10 minutes later, they were playing together as if nothing had happened. We should be like that, huh? What happens if someone throws sand at you? What happens if your husband or your wife throws sand at you? I mean, are you going to be happy with that, Raquel? Mas, por favor, mas. <laughs> no, it's difficult. It's difficult for us to forgive. We hold on to resentment. The childlike, the shepherd, they don't worry about the past or the future, and they don't hold on to grudges and resentments. Amen? Amen. Yeah. Shepherds. I saw, are you following me? I saw the child Jesus in the host. The spirit was immersed in him. There's a lot in that. Now, when I, when I lift up when I lift up the host and I say the words of consecration, what happens? Any Catholics here? <laughs> Some Catholics are here in Polko for a minute, okay? Okay, when I lift up the host, that becomes Jesus. But in what chronological part of his life is he present? I mean? Raquel? 
So that, that, that's another miracle that I reflected on in the past. And now here, here we have it here. She actually saw who? So it was just, what? Related to Christmas, right? See, every consecrated host, you've got the child Jesus there. How about the teenager? How about the young man? How about the man that was preaching for three years? How about the crucified Jesus? How about the risen Jesus? Extraordinary miracle, right? So all the different chronological stages of the life of Christ, from conception in the womb of Mary, all the way up until his ascension in heaven, are present in every consecrated host. Over the past couple of years, my mother says that this is usually what happens to her. She manages the the child Jesus, just as a little child. <clears throat> Could be the fact that she's got nine children and she's got 39 grandchildren and already, I think, 15. Great, they keep coming. Almost every other month there's another one being born. <laughs> Familia de Conecos, right? <laughs> Maybe because she's got contact with a lot of, a lot of the little ones, no? But connecting it with Jesus as a little child. What about you? So when you, when you receive Holy Communion, you, you, clo- you can close your eyes, you can imagine Jesus at any stage of his chronological human development. I would prob- dare to say probably none of you have probably ever done that yet. You might try to do that. Because he's within you. Is really within you. What kind of appeals to me lately is just the, the public life of Christ. Jesus is out preaching and teaching. He's with the apostles. He's doing miracles. Uh, child Jesus is beautiful, but maybe where I am at now, I'm kind of captivated by Jesus in his public life. Healing, healing the sick, preaching, teaching, spelling devils, you know, talking with the apostles. Who is Jesus for you in the Blessed Sacrament? And I believe if you do your Holy Hour well, that's going to improve your relationship with Jesus Christ in the Eucharist. Amen? Amen. I believe that there's an intimate connection between your Holy Hour and the Eucharistic presence of Christ. Amen? Amen. Although he was a tiny child, his majesty penetrated my soul. I was permeated to the depths of my being by this mystery, the great abasement on the part of God, this inconceivable emptying of himself. These sentiments remain vividly alive in my soul all through the festive season. Oh, we shall never comprehend this great self-abasement on the part of God, the more I think of it. So that, that number, that number is a perfect number for all of us as we get ready to celebrate Christmas. It's a perfect number. Last thing she's saying is how Jesus Christ, he humbled himself. When I was teaching confirmation a couple hours ago, I, I, was, t- I was talking to the confirmation students and how to understand how Jesus really humbled himself. And they used a, um, an anecdote or analogy of Fulton Sheen. And this is what I said to them, at 38, 13-year-old kids. Imagine tomorrow morning, you get up, and you go into the bathroom, you turn 
on the light and you look in the mirror and you see a dog face. Okay, a dog face. So your body's turned into the body of a dog. But you still have your, your human soul. And then after you, you brush your teeth and you comb your hair, a little bit more challenging probably, right? <laughs> But a dog breath and you know long hair. And then you go outside and you meet a pack, a pack of dogs. And they look at you and they hate you. They turn on you. They bark at you. They bite you. And they tear you apart. That is a simple analogy of what Jesus Christ went through. Because if you get up in the morning, you, you look in the mirror, you see a dog, that's debasing, that's humiliating. But God becoming a man? Light years more humiliating. What happened to Jesus who became a man? He was torn to pieces on Good Friday. He did all that because of lo love for us. So let's pray for the grace to penetrate to the very depths this wonderful mystery of the birth of Christ. And as Ignatius would say, he was born for you, he lived for you, he suffered for you, he died for you, and he rose from the dead for you. He shed every drop of his precious blood for you. He had to do it a million times. He'd do it a million times because you are very precious in the eyes of God. Amen. Amen. Hail Mary, full of grace, the Lord is with thee. Blessed art thou among women. Blessed the fruit of thy womb, Jesus. Holy Mary, Mother of God, pray for our sinners. Now at the hour of our death. The Lord be with you. May Almighty God bless you, the Father and the Son, the Holy Spirit. Okay? God bless you. And we'll see you next Friday, okay?